welcome to What the Duck, a podcast with real experts talking about direct spin challenges and experiences. And now, here's your host, Source Day's very own manufacturing maven, Sarah Scudder. Thanks for joining me for What the Duck, another supply chain podcast brought to you by Source Day. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and this is the podcast for people working in the direct materials part of supply chain. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S Scudder on Twitter. If you are new to the show, make sure to follow this podcast so you don't miss any of our direct material supply chain content. Today, I'm going to be joined by Afif Mango, and we're going to discuss how to reduce the number of past due orders. If you work for a manufacturer and are struggling to get your product to your customers on time, then this is the episode for you. Very, very big challenge for almost every single manufacturer and retailer. If you miss a customer delivery, you can lose a customer for life, get bad reviews, and it can definitely have a ripple effect. Afif started his career in a meat processing factory. In addition to the standard supply chain challenges, he had to deal with expiration dates, regulatory, and health issues. Afif has worked in procurement, production and material planning, logistics and order entry, which gives him an understanding of the entire supply chain. Welcome to the show, Afif. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So what did your first mentor teach you? Uh, he would used to go, uh, you buy well, we sell well, uh, which for the longest while. It took me a while to really understand what he was trying to say with this. Like It just went over my head for a bit, and then I figured it out. Yeah, that was a quote that when we were prepping for our interview that, that really stood out to me, the importance of how buying correctly has such a direct impact to sales and revenue for a manufacturer. So Afif, tell me your story about how you got into direct materials procurement. Um, fresh out of school, I had a, I worked for a company that, I started working for a company that sells detergents and soap. Um, and through one of my sales calls, I met a, a CEO, a, a, then I discovered the CEO of a, a meat processing factory. Um, and I didn't know at the time, so we're just chatting about you know, what I do and how things work and um, and so forth. And he's like, have you thought about supply chain and, and procurement? I'm like, no, what's that? Um, so he started telling me that they're opening this factory and they're renovating this factory and the yeah, yeah, other. And I, I started working there and I discovered my passion working into um, supply chain and how buying and getting components into one end and getting it out of the other is uh, just creating magic. So that's how I got into direct material and, uh, and manufacturing. Why the love for manufacturing? One of the themes throughout your career has been you've always either worked at manufacturing companies or been in the IT space working to automate processes and systems for manufacturing. I... I'm always fascinated how things are made and uh, how things um, get created. So manufacturing and technology are both the same. Like it's just putting input from one one end and creating a product from the other end and making making magic happen. So I, that was my fascination, and it's always a challenge for me to challenge status quo, looking for better ways to do things. So. On. So one of the things that stood out to me when we were prepping for our interview today is that you took a gig doing order entry and you felt this was one of the most important positions that you held in your career. Why is that and what did you learn from it? Um, It was um, a a, a what started to be a two week gig uh, doing order uh, managing an order entry team. Uh, for Honeywell, um, and the amount of details that go into an order, and the, I didn't realize how much work goes in it and how it is, how important it is, till I worked for that team. Um, 
uh, most of the professionals that worked at the team were seasoned professionals in that industry. Um, it was in the pulp and paper um, uh, um, uh, realm for Honeywell. And then they started asking secondary questions. I would hear this team interact with the customers, the customers being procurement, engineering, um, maintenance folks, like across the board. And, and what I've learned from them is they always ask secondary questions uh, and listen to what they're asking for and give them suggestion and say, and, and would say, did you think about you ordering this? However, you need also need to order this, this maintenance kit, or you need to add this. And if you're changing this part, you also need to add to change this other part. Like it's, it wasn't just upsell. It was more of providing them a service and ordering a product into a way that um, understanding what they're asking for and making sure the team is understanding what they wanted and relaying as much as, as much as, and as clear as information down the pipe, because they're the first entry point between the customer and the rest of the organization. So they took their job of uh, getting as much clear information as clear as possible and as fast as possible. So it was fascinating for me how that was, how that has a rippling effect across the board. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like the, the seeking out more information, asking questions, being a good listener, really helped you do well in the manufacturing space since it's such a process driven industry and you really, really helped from end to end with manufacturing plants, looking at what's working and what's not working. So walk me through your career progression and, um, you know, tell me where you're at today. Um, um, my career has started within uh, uh, meat processing, manufacturing. Then I worked for a company working in uh, FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods, um, and then going into uh, heavily more into uh, heavy manufacturing, and then switching to technology procurement. Um, but it's procurement and supply chain has always been the theme. What what that me working in different industries given me a different perspective on how different manu- industries handle procurement. So it's giving me an added edge on looking for different solutions and providing different answers and, and understanding how the process works and where there's added value and where's you know, wasted effort or just non- non-value added um, solutions in, in manufacturing, in technology, in software, in hardware. There's always things to be changed and things to be automated and making it better. Um, right now where I'm at, I'm in, uh, you know, seeking my next adventure. Um, the last few years I worked in uh, the technology and manufacturing realms, um, setting up procurement teams, getting to know um, how to create an added value, a better added value procurement in technology, especially for startups. So in the last six months, what have been the t- one or two greatest direct material challenges that you've had to personally <clears throat> overcome? Um, the two things that keep popping into my head is the changing uh, deadlines and pricing. Um, like the delivery dates and the price changes. Um, and I think those are one of the bigger ones. So a, a common theme when we were prepping for our interview that, that continuously came up was your work around how to make purchase order changes not so painful. So I'd like to have you start by talking about why do manufacturers have so many purchase orders changes? And, and I uh, see that you're laughing when I say this. The memories. <laughs> um, the, the fact is, the purchase order is a lot of ways is the the source of truth. Um, it is how the vendors get paid. 
but at the same time it's the how you how internally you relay information and how it's connected into your your production system and your finance system so two crucial importance money and time um, and it goes back to my first mentor if you buy well we sell well um, why the changes and why it's important and why it's not you know? the day-to-day -day um, life of um, a, an operational buyer or even somebody that's not a buyer but goes into uh, entering purchase orders um, you get these requests that are flying in left right and center um, sometimes organized sometimes not organized but your job is to process them as quick as possible as fast as possible and uh, and just making it happen to make sure that you're putting this information in as accurately as possible with the right information and and moving into the next text so you can you know reduce that that uh, in, you know, the backlog of a request or orders that come in from internal stakeholders. Um, and the components that, the, one of the bigger components that go into a, a standard purchase order is what the item is, what the quantity is, and the delivery date. Uh, if it's not a preset delivery date, lead time, you have to put that information in that uh, to the vendor, I need you to deliver this item X within, you know, a certain period of time. And you move on. Um, Part of the challenges there is you get the, the PO confirmation or the order confirmation from the vendor, which occasionally has a price change and or a uh, delivery date change. Um, unless you're... In your career, were those the two most common changes that you've seen, price change and delivery date change? Yes. And then the, um, oh, this item is no longer uh, end of life. This is a replacement part, that kind of stuff. So I had to really that or or out of stock, discontinued or, product or discontinued out of stock. Exactly. So so okay. part of my job was to go back to, you know, the engineering team or the design team saying, hey, what this item is no longer available. This is the replacement part, or this manufacturer doesn't have this part. We have to look for a different manufacturer or different supplier. So <laughs> moving parts, and this is on top of your daily um, task of you know, operational buy. Um, so the, the less interruption that you get as a, an organization from the outside, meaning the price change, delivery day change, discontinuity, that kind of stuff, it's it's a lot of part and it's a lot of changes. Um, so. And, and these then, changes uh, that are coming in pretty rapidly is, is how are they come, how are they coming into you and your team? And that's, that's a very good point. That's what I wanted to mention is then trying to dig information on what changes happen. Because sometimes if you're not on top of the changes and end of the week or end of the month when you get this invoice from your vendor and your finance team comes and says, there's a discrepancy in um, the value of what we're paying, you know, our internal PO system says we need to pay the vendors X amount and their invoice says Y amount. There's a, there's a variance and you have to go spend an extra time to find, figure out the differences or the item doesn't show up on time and you have your manufacturing folks or production for uh, coming to you and like, where's this item? I'm late. I can't do this. I can't deliver this. So it, it's those follow-ups and those information having a, a way to gather this information in a one stop or let's say one hand to shake to figure out this information makes life easier and more efficiently. So what you, what you mentioned earlier was, you know, finding a better way to do this was very important. Mm -hmm. Why is following up with purchase orders so important as well? This is something that you also mentioned many, many times when we were prepping, not only having a better way to deal with the purchase order changes, but also following up with POs. Getting acknowledge, acknowledgement that the purchase order has been received and it's being processed. You know, it, it, um, if you, if I am sending a purchase order or a buyer sending a purchase order and not following up on it, you assume that the vendor has received it and they're actioning it. The fact is, it may have been you know, misread, not actioned. They forgot to deal with it, whatever. There's a million and one reasons what could go wrong. And all of a sudden, 
it comes back to you. Um, a lot of our job is um, I, a lot. I go teach this to my junior staff or people starting in supply chain. It's a lot of ways. It's a thankless job. If we do our job very well, nobody knows we exist. But at the moment. You know, things fall off the rails. Every all of a sudden, everybody's after us for you know updates and what happened, why the changes and whatnot. So avoiding those kind of conversations in in a good way, um, getting information in as good as as fast as possible, as clear as possible, um, will allow us to be um, uh, buying better, so we can sell better. How have you? managed the PO follow-up process with you and your teams so it's not so crazy and cumbersome? Um, <clears throat> a lot of ways in, at the time, not a lot of automation tools were available. Um, so it was, you know, what have we done this week? Today I've sent these, just go back and follow up on, did I send this, is this done? Did we talk to the vendor and just go to the vendor and say, today I've sent you, X invoices or X purchase orders, um, and I look at um, uh, what then I would put a variance report, pricing, invoice pricing versus um, uh, purchase order pricing, and look for changes. So it's a, it's a lot of manual, strenuous details going into the details. So it it would have helped a lot having a Somewhere where I can look at this rather than going into, you know, different tools and different Excel sheets and following updating Excel sheets. And, you know, so it's a lot of follow up. I call it death by email or death by Excel. True. So we, we've chatted about why there are so many purchase order changes, what are those typical changes, and then why is following up PO so important. The, the title of our conversation today and the topic for our discussion is around preventing past due delivery. So how do you actually get your product to your consumers on time? Right. Um, past due orders are a major, major problem for manufacturers. I think every manufacturing company that myself and my team have ever worked with have, have struggled with this and it can cause you to go out of business. In one of your roles, you reduced past due orders by 66.6%, .6%, which went from $1.2 million to $400,000 in just 21 days. How did you do this? Um, this was back at with the Honeywell gig, the two weeks, and then my boss said, hey, you want to come in full time? And then he's like, oh, by the way, we're... Uh, we're adding, we're moving a production facility from uh, Phoenix, Arizona to um, uh, to my facility. And because of the change, the ERP systems didn't connect. And all of a sudden, there's this like, backlog of orders. Um, and and what, what ERPs were you on? Uh, the, the new ones were Oracle and SAP. Um, okay. and, uh, so it was fun just for me back to technology and, and going to order entry, like building bills of material, understanding what the bill of material does and when it expands, where does it go? And if it's, um, if it's going to production planners or material planners or your tactical buyers, operational buyers, or even the shipping team, it's understanding the order team, the order management team puts it in and where it expands. And that's going back to the details in there. So part of my job is going into, you know, the order management team would go put this order in, but I would follow up literally what uh, what my boss would call walking the line every day. I got a, a, a sequence of orders. Um, I would make sure that the, the bills of material were actually correct, that it's actually going pointing to the right target team. Uh, production planning, material planning, etc., and then going to the material, the the buyers, making sure that they actually got the right request in with the right quantity. It took a lot of details on walking the lines and understanding where is it pointing to. And and once you start fixing those details and how how important it is getting the direct material in, 
in the right way, updating the pricing, updating the lead times, updating the, the, um, the uh, how long does it take to manufacture based on the critical, the critical path, and uh, updating those informations into your ERP or, um, um, or MRP. <clears throat> It helps reduce the stuff. It, it helps reduce the, the backlog of items in there. Understanding, working with the different teams on why things are not working and how to make them better and how to automate all this these um, requests. So um, a lot of details. So it sounds like it was a lot of manual work and the oh, yeah. focus was on cleaning up the data and getting that clean data back into your ERP. Yes. And and a lot of Another... a lot of, a lot of sorry. All right. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say a lot of this information was the operational buyers were just manual information that they needed to process into the purchase order um, uh, platform, like whatever they're putting the information, the, the acknowledgement that came back or the lack of um, the follow up on those purchase orders were, you know, quantity, uh, delivery, pricing, lead times affected. It has a terrific trickle effect, a major trickle effect on your end product. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you mentioned to me when we are prepping for our chat today is that you improved key performance indicators, also known as KPIs, which the key focus was on time to promise performance from 70% to 95% by improving processes. So what does on time to promise performance mean? And then how did you make such a big improvement in this statistic? It is uh, doing what you say you're going to do on uh, in the time you said you're going to do it. In, in simple translation, if you, a sales guy, a sales person goes to um, a customer and says, I'm going to deliver this item to you in on this date, uh, that's part of being a good supplier. Um, every supply chain professional out there would know that a reliable supplier is a supplier that's going to deliver the product when needed, as needed at that time. So holding that into um, um, holding that standard is what drives me and my team to perform in a certain way. When I update the lead times in there, I know what the production timeline is so when i might impo import my input and components arrive on time that allows the sales or the organization to deliver on time so that's how i got um an improvement on the uh lead times um on the weighted average lead time by holding the fact that yes we're going to get this item delivered on time and this is the production time and this is when we're going to deliver it and planning accordingly. So again, it, it, it's kind of a common theme here is going back to having clean, good data. Exactly. Actually knowing when the supplier is able to deliver, what the actual pricing is, and making sure that information is in your ERP. Exactly. Another metric that you focused on in your career is called weighted average lead time. And at one point, um, you were able to actually reduce this from 65 days to 56 days, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in, in manufacturing world, that, that's quite a dramatic decrease. What is weighted average lead time and why was this so important to have this time reduced? Uh, give me a sec here. Uh, can you edit this out? edit this question out no no uh, give me a minute like i'm just gonna be quiet for a sec i just need to remind myself okay. about something um
Awesome. Sorry, I'm I'm back. Um, so, you know, the lead time is you know the delivery date minus the date when your the order was placed. So basically, when you're getting the order shipped, the components shipping in, how much lead time you need to make this product and when it ships out. Uh, why is this important? Is when a buyer is out there looking for a supplier to supply certain products. One of the criteria most buyers look at is price, delivery time. So when the salesperson goes in to sell the product, they can say, I can deliver this item within X amount of time, which gives average, gives a lot of advantages for, it's not just pricing, it's also delivery time. You can, you can have the, the cheapest price in the world, but if your lead time is way too far, there's no value in there. But when you show up, when a Swiss person shows up to a customer and says, here's my price, here's my delivery time, I can make this happen, that's an advantage value. Back to reliability and going into finding a better product. So how did you, so you reduced the weighted average lead time from 65 days to 56 days. How did you do this? The, <clears throat> a lot of manual process then, um, understanding what the lead times for different items, different manufacturers or different suppliers and different items, updating that information into the ERP system. Um, um, and then calculating what needs to happen, um, looking at inventory levels, um, and what our average production was, what we needed to have inventory, and how we can make a this a better cycle a cycle time. So a lot, of work, a lot of work with the production planners, um, the inventory planners, and uh, the leadership saying, this is the added value of increasing the inventory on X product or increasing there. And actually looking at the, the lead times right now, with all these challenges in supply chains and logistics and shipping and all that kind of fun stuff that everybody's facing right now, having those components into the equation and, and looking at better ways to do things allowed for a better response time to make that happen. So that's how what the what what I've done. I'm I'm really you know watering it down, but a lot of details, a lot of manual work, um, and then seeing if we can do this better and how can we do this better. So going back to the the topic of conversation for today, which is about how manufacturers can reduce late orders, aka how can they get their orders to their consumers on time. You mentioned that you designed and implemented production procedures for private label manufacturing. At this part or this time in your career, tell me a little bit about how you did this and what you did to reduce the past due order challenges for the, the private label manufacturing. Um, <laughs> this was actually a very fun project. Um, I, I worked for a, um, um, a heavy steel manufacturing facility and they do a lot of private labels for um, your Ronas and uh, Home Depot and 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 so forth and the home and the home Reno industry I should say just these guys. Um, but part of the question, part of the the challenge was the sales folks would go out there make the sales and all of a sudden the the production planners would have this challenge where they're shifting production to accommodate for these requests. And so being in supply chain, it kind of comes back to me like, hey, can we get this better? Can we get this faster? What's happening there? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. help me understand, you know. Darn why sales the, people. Why the fire? It, it's <laughs> it's okay. Like the sales, the sales guys, the sales folks are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and and so in supporting them, giving them the tool that asks these questions. And, and a lot of times it's, you can make this product, but all of a sudden you can't sell it, you can't send it out because you're missing a label. 
as, as you know, enabled doesn't cost that much, but however, you can send the box without a sticker. Like it's just this, it's just simple as that. Um, so what I did with this is I've created this um, procedure form where I'm making it easy and simple for the sales folks. When they go out, send a private label, they have, if you will, a questionnaire that says, um, you know, what are you looking for? What item, what kind of packaging is this? And it has embedded in there the information that says, if you're looking for this kind of packaging, it's going to be an additional, you know, week or whatnot, or this is the cost that's going to look there. It's asking these questionnaires, and in a lot of ways, it's also the intake form to the sales order. It's not just putting a sales requisition in. It's also providing that information that, you know, this is the private label that they wanted. This is the artwork that they need to provide. This is what needs to happen for us to deliver on this time. If all of these components are available, it's going to take, you know, X amount of time to deliver. And, and, and having that correct relay of information back to the client puts the sales folks, positions them in a better place to make that sale. Thank you for discussing how to reduce the number of past due orders today, Afif. Where would you like to send people to find you? Uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> I live and breathe LinkedIn. It's Afif Mango on LinkedIn. A-F-I-F and Mango, M-A-N-G-O. If you missed anything, you can check out the show notes. You can find us by typing in What the Duck, another supply chain podcast in Google. To have optimal search results, make sure to add another supply chain podcast in your search. To ensure you don't miss a single episode, make sure to follow this podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S. Scudder on Twitter. This brings us to the end of another episode of What the Duck, another supply chain podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and we'll be back next week. <laughs>